Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Sarah Paretsky, author of the new novel, Overboard, the 22nd novel in the best-selling V.I. Warshawski mystery series. In addition to writing numerous best-selling novels, in 1986, Sarah created Sisters in Crime, a worldwide organization to support women crime writers. Which, it, which earned her Miss Magazine's 1987 Woman of the Year Award. The British crime writers awarded her the Cartier Diamond Dagger for Lifetime Achievement, and her novel Blacklist won the Gold Dagger from the British crime writers for Best Novel of 2004. And she has received the honorary degree of Doctor of Letters from several different universities. Best-selling writer Karen Slaughter wrote about Sarah, an author of matchless intelligence, craft, and power. This is why Sarah Paretsky reigns as one of the all-time greats. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. I'm really delighted to be here, Jeff. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your new V.I. Warshawski novel, Overboard, how would you describe the novel? Well, in some ways, I always think my books are like a suitcase that you have tried to put too many clothes in and little bits of a slip or a pajama leg are sticking out. But if it's pared down to its essentials, Overboard is really the story of two runaway teenagers. They come from families that are being fragmented by the divisions that are ripping America apart these days. And the families are also suffering under the weight of the medical bills and medical decision-making that are crushing too many people these days. So when V.I. Warshawski comes into their lives and tries to protect the kids, she ends up finding herself in a kind of headlong collision with some of Chicago's biggest power brokers and the corrupt cops that they have on their payroll. While she tries to save the kids without getting killed herself, I have to say that VI, even though she's encountered a lot of danger and a lot of physical risks in the past, this book pushes the poor woman pretty much to her limits. <laughs> when, when am I going to leave her alone and let her be Mycroft Holmes in an armchair overlooking the park? <laughs> well, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write Overboard? You know, it, it started... Actually, I was in Columbia, Missouri, visiting one of my brothers, and I was shocked by the number of homeless people that I was seeing. You know, this is a smallish city, small city, and every doorway had somebody sleeping in it at night, the downtown stores. So I started talking to some of the people there, especially people with kids, and found that a, a sort of a heartbreaking number had been left homeless by trying to pay medical bills that had bankrupted them. And so I started wanting to write a book that that had that under that problem underlying it. This was my pandemic novel. I wrote it during lockdown and during all of the upheavals of the last two, three years. So like a lot of writers, I had trouble grappling with the storyline and and pulling it together. But the underlying impetus definitely is from this this uh, horror story that is contemporary American medicine. Sure. And and I'm curious, what was your initial writing journey that led you to writing the first VI novel, Indemnity Only, that was published in 1982? Oh, gosh. You know, I just filled out a questionnaire for the Guardian newspaper <laughs> saying, when did I know that I was a writer? And I have to say, I still don't really know that I'm a writer. I didn't, I grew up writing. It's how I came to terms with things in my life. Or the, some of the, you know, the, I guess the stresses that every child faces to some degree or another, and you're trying to make sense of, of the adults around you. But I never imagined that I would be writing for publication at the same time, I I was a huge reader of crime fiction. In fact, it's still my kind of go-to, the, the kind of books that I like the best are crime novels. Mm -hmm. um, and in the early 70s, as second wave feminism was 
was sweeping me up along with so many other women, I started thinking, gosh, all these books, it's women trying to get good boys to do bad things. You know, they take off their clothes and suddenly the boys are tempted almost beyond their limits of self-control, but not quite. And I thought, I really want a woman detective who turns the tables on that image of women. I want to show the kind of woman that my friends were. You know, we had to solve our own problems. We didn't have a knight errant rescuing us. At the same time, we could have sex lives without being immoral and evil. And so VI really came out of that. But it really it took me almost eight years from when I first started thinking, I want to do this, to when I finally had the courage to sit down and actually start writing. And, and can you remember, what, what was the initial... Uh, response from publishers when you started submitting indemnity only. And, and, you know, I should add, I mean, I, I think I've mentioned it, but, you know, when, when you wrote the first novel, it was pretty groundbreaking. And, and now, I mean, you know, there's, there's, you know, plenty of, of female PIs and female uh, detectives, but, but I'm curious, what, was there resistance on the part of publishers in, in the um, late 70s and early 80s when you were starting to submit this? Yes, indeed, there was. I was turned down. In those days, there were a lot more independent publishing houses than there are now. Now there are like four or five big conglomerates. But then you went to each house one after another. And I believe I was turned down by 42. And um, my agent, Dominic Gable, who's been with me from the beginning and been a, really helped me have a career. Uh, he was beginning to advise me to try to write something else when suddenly Dial Press, which was part of, of Doubleday at that point, uh, one of the editors who was reading the slush pile, as they call the unsolicited manuscripts, uh, she she had spent her summers in Chicago as a child, and and so the book really resonated with her more for the Chicago setting than for the for the detective. But there were, I can still, uh, I mean, re, re, editors said things like um, in, that nobody wanted a, a woman detective, that I was too talky. My favorite rejection, and all my rejection letters are with my papers at the Newberry Library in Chicago. But my favorite rejection was that uh, the book was set in Chicago and, and there weren't enough people who read books in the Midwest to make it profitable to publish a book <laughs> set in, in Chicago. So I was like, right you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious, how much research did you do about this kind of dilemma of medical debt in you know, uh, in current American society as you were working on your new novel, Overboard? I did as much as, as I could. It, it was really hard to come up with the right storyline because the more I read, the more I realized my books, my plots depend on people doing something that is either illegal or shameful that they are going to commit murder to cover up and keep from being discovered. Well, the the gross profits that are being made by big medical facilities, there's nothing illegal about it. It's disgusting. It's immoral, but nobody, but people are proud of it. They're proud of making these billions of dollars. So it, it became a real struggle as I was doing the research to find the right storyline. And one story that, that came across my uh, radar had to do with a, a tiny division within the Department of Justice, the U.S. Department of Justice, that looks after fraud being committed specifically with the way opioids are are distributed to uh, people who are struggling with opioid addiction. And um, uh, this little, this tiny corner of the DOJ, they found that there were big hospital chains where they were getting opioid addicts to sign away the title to their homes in exchange for a lifetime supply of drugs, which now that was both illegal and shocking. And so I turned my attention to that, that little sliver of, of what was going on in, in the medical 
pharmaceutical industrial complex or whatever it's called. <laughs> right. Well, I'm curious, what is your writing process when you're working on a novel? And has it changed over the years? Do you, given the fact that you are writing mysteries, do you outline the novel extensively before you sit down and, and start uh, working and diving into the narrative? I wish that I was someone who could outline the novel. I'm working on a new book now. And I thought, okay, this time I'm really going to have it all figured out before I sit down to write because my my process, such as it is, involves trial and error. I I write, sometimes I've written as much as 200, 250 pages, and then I see I've gone down a rabbit hole that I can't get out of, and I throw out the work and start over again. So I thought this time it's going to go straight forward from beginning to end because I'm going to outline it. But it turns out I can't think that way. I am not a chess player. I can't think more than one or two moves ahead. So I have to write and see whether um, I have a backstory that I know. And my my job is to create a front story that dazzles the reader and keeps them from seeing the backstory. And so I keep changing the front story, how I'm working it out until I finally get a front story that works for the backstory. I don't know. Does that make sense? It sounds kind of <laughs> trying to describe a dance to a person who's never seen people dance. Sure. I, I, I think it makes sense. So, so as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, you, you created this organization, Sisters in Crime. What, what led you to uh, create that? Well, Early in my career, I was I was very lucky in the kind of review attention that I got. And um, Sue Grafton, uh, who we sadly are still missing, but Sue and I published our first books together, really. We didn't know each other. She was in Santa Barbara. I was in Chicago. But we, we both got the same kind of media attention. And... I just took for granted that that was what every writer got. And then I started meeting women writers at crime conventions who definitely were not having that experience. And their their careers were ending because libraries make their decisions on whether to buy a, a book for their collections based on two or sometimes three reviews in jury publications, whether they're online these days or in print as it was in the 80s. So if your book isn't getting that kind of attention, nobody's going to buy your book and bookstores don't know about it. They don't stock the book. And I began hearing this more and more and finally thought, we need an advocacy group. And I got uh, the women that I knew at that time, there were 26, I think of us. I got them together at the big crime convention that was held in Baltimore the fall of 1986 and said, you know, if you're interested in forming an organization, let's do it. And if you're not, let's uh, stop whining so much. So there was great enthusiasm for it. And Sisters, Sisters in Crime came out of that. And the first thing that we did actually was to start looking at book reviews. So uh, uh, Jim Huang, who used to be the editor of a mystery publication called The Druid Review, he gave us a list of a thousand crime novels, thrillers, mysteries that had been published in 1987. We did the review project for 1987. And then we had readers combing 200 different newspapers, magazines, and so on for book reviews. And what we found was that a book by a man, crime novel by a man, was seven times more likely to be reviewed than a book by a woman. So we thought, well, you know, Men maybe write twice as well as we do, but not seven times as well as we do. And so we started writing to all of these newspapers, magazines, all these things that were that were print in those days and said, you know, we're monitoring you. We'd love to see more reviews of books by women. And we started getting um, we started really instantly seeing change. I don't think there was. I don't think there was deliberate, we hate women going on. It was more that people, it's like what was in their comfort zone, what they were used to looking at, what they were used to reviewing. And as soon as they started thinking about it, uh, they started giving our writers attention. And then libraries started inviting us in to speak and bookstores started 
carrying shelves of books by women. And um, it's, I know it sounds very vain to say this, but I think we really grew the industry. We heard from so many women readers saying, I hadn't touched a mystery since I outgrew Nancy Drew because I wasn't seeing myself in, mm-hmm. in the books. And then they'd go into a bookstore and they'd see a shelf of books by women and then they'd see a wall of books by women. And, and our books started just growing the market. We weren't sacrificing books by men, but we were increasing readership in the industry. That's great. What, what, what writing advice would you offer for those who are writing their own stories and novels? I think that you have to be writing something that you really care about. I know that there have been incredibly successful writers who follow a formula and write to the marketplace. I spent a lot of years working in the corporate world. I was a marketing manager for a big multinational uh, financial services company. And, um, you know, I got decent pay and I had health care benefits and all that kind of stuff. And if I was just writing by the numbers, writing to the market, um, I, I just, I think I'd rather be back in the corporate world than, than to do that. So if there's something that you care about, keep at it, keep doing it. Um, there are many outlets now, online outlets, really good outlets for self-publishing if you can't find a traditional publisher. Um, and I, I have a friend who's in public relations who, for, for writers, and she mm-hmm. says, uh, every book has a reader, and sometimes it's hard for that book to find its reader, but, um, but it will find a reader. Sure. I think that's true. I, that, that sounds good. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? One book that I'm in the middle of that I'm loving is called The Dictionary of Lost Words by Pip Williams. And uh, it's not exactly a mystery. I said mm-hmm. I love mysteries, which I do, but, um, but it's, it's set in England around 1900, set in the making of the Oxford English Dictionary. And uh, I love the protagonist. I love the writing. This woman, Pip Williams, she just writes like, um, I don't know, it, her prose is so beautiful. You just are really taken in, along in a journey with her because of her writing. I just read uh, my first novel by um, a new crime writer, uh, Louisa Luna, uh, who has, um, she has a, she's another very good prose stylist. And uh, her woman, Private Eye, um, Vegas, I think her name is. Alice Vegas, I'm not getting the name quite right. Anyway, she really makes VI look like Miss Marple in retirement. That was <laughs> super tough, but the writing, it was, a, it was a good ride to ride along with her. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your latest VI novel? Uh, thank you. People can find me at sarahparetsky.com. They can sign up for a newsletter if um, I send one out every now and then very randomly. And I'm also on Facebook. I'm pretty active on Facebook. I love engaging with readers and writers on my page. I get so much thoughtful input uh, just about life and the world. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with best-selling novelist Sarah Paretsky, author of the V.I. Warshawski novels, and the latest novel in the series is Overboard, and the novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Sarah, thanks a lot for doing this interview. Oh, thank you, Jeff. This was great fun. I really appreciate your time and interest. Great. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of Overboard by Sarah Paretsky. Read by Susan Erickson. Available from Harper Audio, wherever audiobooks are sold. It was Mitch who found the girl. I'd stopped at a cemetery on the Chicago-Evanston border to let him and Peppy stretch their legs, and he took off. I ran after him, but I'd left the dogs in the car too long. Mitch was out to prove I wasn't the boss of him. Cars swerved, honked, brakes squealed as he bolted across Sheridan Road and disappeared down a boulder-covered hill to the lake. 
Somehow, I hung on to Peppy's leash as she chased him. We crossed the road without being hit, but almost toppled a cyclist on the other side. I peered anxiously down the rocky hillside, trying to see Mitch, but he'd vanished. He still had his leash on, at risk for a broken leg or worse if it caught on an outcropping. There were too many crevices in the rocks and concrete blocks the city had dropped there. I called to him, strained to hear a bark or a cry, but the lake was crashing into the rocks in front of me. Cars on Sheridan kept up a steady roar behind me. Peppy was still straining to follow Mitch. I unhooked her leash so she'd find him for me. She began sliding and clawing her way down the wet rocks and stopped at a spot about 20 feet below me. A strong spring wind was slamming waves onto the shore, sending spray high enough to wet my legs as I backed down, crab-like, holding onto the rocks to keep from sliding into the froth. When I finally reached Peppy, she was barking at Mitch's hindquarters. His head and shoulders were wedged between two boulders. I shoved her out of my way and pulled Mitch out. I managed to muscle in front of him and stick my own head into the narrow opening. He was whining, even snapping at my ankles in his desperation to get back in. I shone my phone's flashlight inside the opening. I'd been expecting some dead, rotting animal, but it was a girl, young, wearing a thin T-shirt that revealed small breasts. I slid forward, put my fingers on her neck, felt a faint pulse. I backed out. Mitch instantly ran in again, Peppy slithering in next to him. I tried calling 911, but couldn't get a signal down there. It would be impossible for me to force the dogs up the rocks, not when they had a mission and I was in slip-sliding shoes. I left them and worked my way back up to the edge of the road and called 911. A squad car appeared almost instantly. The driver got out and demanded an ID. A girl is stuck in the rocks down there. She needs help. I can't manage. I got a complaint about a lady and her dogs. You can't let them run around off leash. Let's see some ID. Please, look, there's a girl trapped down there. I came up to call for help. She needs an emergency crew with ropes and a stretcher. He pressed his lips together, called into his lapel phone that he was investigating a possible emergency. He came to the barrier between the road and the rocks, gripping my arm, but he looked down and saw Mitch's tail. Peppy was smaller. She must have squirmed in front of him. That your dog? The girl is barely alive, I said frantic. Please, you can see for yourself if you climb down. He looked sourly at the rocks, but was saved by his phone. He exchanged a few sentences, then turned to me. Someone called in a complaint from the high rise there. He jerked his head at a building on the other side of the road. Said a woman was taking her dogs down the rocks here. I guess that was you. Can you call the dogs, get them to come up? They won't leave the girl, and I'm not strong enough to carry them up these boulders. He looked over the side again, communed again with his lapel phone. We're locating a rescue team. But if this is a false alarm, it's a class four felony. Seize the day with another daily affirmation from Best Fiends. Happiness does not always come from within. Inner peace is great and all, but you know what's even better? Making it to level 1000 playing the puzzle adventure game Best Fiends. Because sometimes, true satisfaction comes from absolute victory. 
You can download Best Fiends for free and play it anywhere, even if you're stuck without Wi-Fi. Collect a team of fiendish friends and power them up as you play more levels. Battle the menacing slugs as you solve puzzles using your team of characters. Every win brings new challenges, and with thousands of levels, there's always more to play. Find the happiness that doesn't start from within. Download Best Fiends for free today on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends.